Oh, God, parenting is so hard. Flesh and bones walking around and we have a life and then we die. You created linear time. Is that even a thing? Hello, I'm Fern Cotton and I'm here at Penguin to answer some big questions. Being a good parent is so bloody hard. It's, it's the hardest job every day, but it's the most beautiful job and privilege. And I still sometimes think, I don't know the rules, I don't know how this works. I don't know what I'm doing. I need to call someone, like someone needs to tell me how this works, I don't get it. Well, I feel like that probably every day. I feel confused as to how much I'm meant to push my kids versus sort of let them do their own thing. It's a constant moving with it, pulling back, but I just don't know how it works still. The only thing I'm certain about is that if you show them love daily, that's a really good start. If you just show them that you are there, you love them, no matter what they do or what their choices are in life, that's a really strong foundation. That's the only thing I'm certain on. The rest, like the rule book, or how you're meant to do things, or the best way to nurture them to find their purpose, whatever, I don't know. It's too hard, it's too complicated. I never get enough sleep to work it out with a clear head. I just don't know. But I think if we can every day wake up, and even if they've been up all night, like mine were last night, to approach a situation, you haven't got to be unrealistic, like, it doesn't matter, darling, that you didn't sleep all night and sort of fairy tale about it. But as long as what you're saying and the boundaries you're setting are like have love beneath them and there's that foundation there, then I don't suppose you can go too wrong. I think. Like fame is so misrepresented, so much so that I still believe in it. Like, I still get pulled into the trap. I will watch people like Emma Stone when La La Land was out and she's at all the awards ceremonies and I've just watched the film and wept and it was amazing and she was incredible. And I'm now in the fantasy land that she is living some euphoric life um, that doesn't exist. I can see how it works. And I've seen how it works because I've sort of been through it over the years and I've interviewed countless people who are at varying degrees of fame, whatever that is. And my own learning has been that it is meaningless. It can certainly give you great opportunities at times. You've got to put the legwork in, but it can present interesting opportunities. But fame isolated as a thing is, is sort of nothingness. It's, it, if anything, it's the sort of more annoying bits of a job that I love. To me, it's the bit where there's uh, ungoverned commentary on your life. And then there's the job, which is separate to that, which might bring fame, but that is full of substance and learning and depth and like a never ending, like, where's this gonna take me? Um, so yeah, I'll deal with it and it's fine. It's no big deal, but I'm not, doing what I do over here to get that. The answer to this question has very much changed for me over the years. If you'd asked me in my 20s, I would say it had to be the, the top bit of the roller coaster, sort of an electrifying happiness. Whereas my happiness today, it varies certainly, but it's usually found for me in moments of solitude because that's the sort of happiness that I feel has longevity or that I can go back to. Whereas the big roller coaster moments, that's not sustainable. The next day, obviously, you're a bit more back down to earth and, and then you might start worrying, why did I say this? Could that have been better? It's, it's not solid. The moments where I feel truly happy now, you know, could just be like one single bird flying in the sky or the fact there's this amazing flower that's, you know, springing out of nowhere. It's simple stuff where I truly feel grounded at a, a level of contentment that I know is reachable again the next day or at least in the next week. Whereas that roller coaster one, you don't know when that's coming again. It might not be for another year. So I'm not seeking that anymore. My happiness is just in sort of yeah, grounding, gratitude and seeing the bigger picture rather than, oh my God, I shouldn't have done this, shouldn't have said that. What does that person think of me? It's a, it, it's a bit more of an expansive, 
perspective of life. It would be a rather painful prospect if that were true. If we were to say that was it, I would not get out of bed in the morning. You know, pop music was at its best. We had Brit pop going on and the fashion's now back because I constantly look around and go, oh my God, I had those shoes and that terrible crop top. I probably still got it in the loft if you want it. But to say it was the last great era, I think would be really tragic. I actually look back to the late 60s, early 70s. I wasn't around then, obviously, I hope obviously. I look back at that era with sort of an element of FOMO because I wish I'd been there. That to me seemed like an era that is potentially a time we can't recreate. Like that was a one-off. That was the sort of post-war freedom and, and the expression of that and new music coming over from America and then new music starting in the UK with the Beatles and the Stones and that was exciting. So I think we can look back at the 90s really fondly, more fondly than we felt at the time, but we also have to give room to, well, what could be amazing and a beautiful form of expression in the future? I hope not. I really hope not because it's a beautiful medium, but I'm also very excited at the prospect of other forms of audio being popular, like podcasts. If I hadn't found that medium, I think I'd feel quite frustrated at the moment because I love having, could be an hour, could be two hours, to explore subjects really thoroughly. And as much as I adore the sort of fast paced notion of radio and the fact that I got to learn so much from doing that for so long, to have no rules is actually really beautiful. Because radio sounds like there are no rules, but it's full of rules because you have to hit timings and you have to keep things entertaining, emotive. Whereas in a podcast, it's a blank page and you go with it. So as much as I don't want radio to sort of fade into the background, I'm really excited about where podcasting and other audio mediums can, can take us. I don't think social media can be boxed into any one thing. It can be a place of beautiful connection. But there's always the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is that it's sort of relatively ungoverned. So I think there are beautiful things, there are dangerous things, and there's grey in the middle, but it's more about how we imbibe and process that information, and we've got to give kids the tools to do that sensibly. We certainly need more governance and more education around it, but I think, generally speaking, it's in, you know, the eye of the beholder. There'll be people out there that believe we are just flesh and bones walking around and we have a life and then we die. Absolutely fine. You know, I'm not here to change your mind. There'll be people out there who have been brought up within a religion, so you have a name for what is bigger than us and there is an infrastructure that you follow, there might be rules, and that makes you feel good and you're part of a community. Ace, again, not here to change your mind. Then there's people like me who certainly believe and are curious in what is bigger than us, but I don't have the language often. I don't know what words to apply to, to, to how I feel it, because it is a feeling. I sense there is something bigger. I've had, like many people, inexplicable moments of life where it feels underpinned by something bigger. I go to bed every night and I go through a little prayer in my head and I'm in communication with that bigger something. We can call it God. I find it a very bleak prospect that we are just walking around as flesh and bones and then we die without feeling that magic that's there. And I have felt that magic since I was a kid. And it will be mixed in with times of great pain and challenge. But there's always a little magic out there somewhere. And it might end up being something that seems quite miraculous. Or it could just be a really beautiful feeling that you can't quite put your finger on. But I certainly believe there's something at play. And if I remove that, from my life, I, I feel flat. I feel really flat. I don't want to go through life feeling flat. I want to be surprised constantly. I want to stay super curious to what's going on around me. I don't want to feel like I know it all and that's it, full stop. I, I know 
you know, that I'm, I'm just going to die and there's nothing and, that, and that's that. That doesn't suit me. I want to be curious and wide-eyed and walk through my entire life wondering and questioning and never feeling like I know the answer because none of us, none of us know any of this stuff. We don't know what happens when we die. No one knows that. We don't know what's at play. We don't know what the point of all this is. We don't know if there's other planets out there with other beings. We don't know how time works. We've created linear time. Is that even a thing? We know nothing. And let's all agree on that. Thank you so much for watching. You can get my book, Bigger Than Us, in hardback, ebook, and audio by clicking the link in the description below. And don't forget to click here to subscribe for more videos from Penguin like this.